Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome once again to your Wednesday night webinar. I am Dr. Patrick McGrath, Chief Clinical Officer at NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app you can get through Google Play or iOS. Please check us out, free download. And if you're looking for teletherapy across the United States or Canada or Australia or the United Kingdom, we're here. So come on over. Happy to give you a free 15-minute call with our team to see if we could be of assistance to you. All right. And a couple of other things, of course. Uh, if you are a family member or friend of someone with OCD and want some education, you like this stuff that we do here and you want to talk one-on-one -on -one with one of our therapists, we do our No CD 411 sessions. Those education sessions could be really helpful to you if you wanted just to learn about family accommodation or various other things, especially if you have someone in your life who maybe isn't quite ready for OCD treatment and you want to know how to best support them. We're happy to help out in those areas areas as well too. So check us out here at NoCD. Let's get into our questions. We got a bunch already that have come in, so we'll jump right in. Uh, Vanessa says, hey, Dr. McGrath, can you have intrusive emotions or feelings? Of course, why couldn't you? Absolutely, 100%. You got it. How can I stop checking for sexual orientation, OCD, emotions, reactions to my thoughts as this is a compulsion? Yes, it is. So um, if your goal right off the bat is going to be to stop doing those things, that's a tough goal, right? <clears throat> because you're just so used to doing it. What I would like you to do is this. If you catch yourself doing it, work on pausing. it. Number one, right? Work on saying, wait a minute, is going down this rabbit hole where I want to go? Will I find an answer that will satisfy me or my OCD? And the answer is going to be no to that question. So what can I do different? How can I go about living my life? You know, sometimes people think I've got to sit here with this thing and I've got to wait for it to go away. I talk to people all the time about, I want you to live your life with this thing and it'll go away as you're living your life. That's what you really want to be uh, doing. Now, can you get to a point of not checking anymore? Sure. I think that you can. Will you probably once in a while check? Sure. You know, there are spikes that we have that happen. Do we have to consider those things as failures if that happens? I wouldn't. I would just say, okay, in the future, what can I do to prevent that spike from grabbing onto me again? Because, boy, that spike got me this time and I want to make sure that it doesn't get me again in the future. So, uh, Vanessa, I hope that that's helpful. You can absolutely, though, have intrusive emotions, feelings, you know, thoughts, images, urges, those types of things that are coming about. And ultimately, work with a therapist, right, who can walk you through some specific exposure and response prevention therapy exercises to help you not giving in to that checking so much to uh, doing those compulsions. And, and they can assist you with that. And I think that if you check us out at NoCD, we could help you with that as well, too. Thomas says, my OCD is constantly changing as it can. It will do sometimes. It never stopped going from one thing to another. What would you recommend I do to avoid allowing my brain to do this to me? I never know what's real or what's not real. I don't have the funds for therapy and I'm too afraid to start medication. I also don't trust therapists after being hurt and improperly assisted for so long. Uh, therapists have led you wrong so many times. I'm not a complete loss of, or you're at a complete loss. I wish you were my therapist. Well, thank you, Thomas. I, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, you know, it is unfortunate uh, for all of you. Let me speak to this a little bit out there that there are sadly a lot of therapists who don't know what OCD is or who don't know what exposure and response prevention therapy is and that it is the gold standard of treatment for obsessive compulsive disorders. So it's always a little bit disturbing when I meet people who have gone through many different types of treatment, much of which was talking and or people being told to stop thinking about something or snap a rubber band on their wrist or something of that nature as a way to try to deal with whatever it is that's going on in their life and including their OCD or other anxiety based types of things as well too. Now, um, Thomas, I think, I think my best recommendation for you is, is to recognize this, that you likely already know 
what's real or not real. It's the doubting of it that is there. I mean, Thomas, let me ask you a question. And, and this is sometimes where it's it's unfortunate that we have to do it this way instead of be live, because it would be almost interesting to have this conversation. But I want to ask all of you this, because maybe all of you have had a similar kind of feeling at some point in time. Uh, when have any of you encountered things that aren't actually real and they were real? Which sounds like a really weird question when I put it out there, right? But that's what OCD tells you, right? OCD will say, yeah, you may think that thing's not real, but it is. Or what if it was? Right? What if it was actually real? Right? So here's the, here's the interesting thing. Not real things don't actually exist. Something that isn't real doesn't actually exist. But your OCD will tell you, well, maybe that not real thing is real. Maybe in your world, not real things actually are real. Maybe in your world, not actual things really do come true. So therefore, you should be afraid of not real things, even if they aren't real, right? Boy, now that sounds like something OCD would love to tell people, right? Not only must you be afraid of the real things, you should also be very afraid of the unreal things because the unreal things can be just as dangerous and bad as the real things. Now, when I say that out loud, does that make sense to anybody? I'm hoping not. But your OCD will go, sure, of course. Yes, well, that that makes total sense. Absolutely, 100%. Why, why wouldn't it be any other way but that, right? And... And that's where I just want people to really kind of recognize this, is that OCD loves a not real thing and to convince you that it's real and lead you to believe that it's true. That's the trickery of OCD. So Thomas, even if you don't have the funds for therapy, right? Uh, you know, one of the things, at least no CD, we do payment plans. So if that could be helpful to you, um, but, and, and I, I'm not going to tell you, Thomas, you have to take medications or anything like that too. That's, that's a very personal decision for you to, to decide, right? But what I'd like you to be able to do, Thomas, is, is try this out for a day. Try out that I'm going to go and experience things today. And, and the actual physical experiences that I'm having are true. And just see what it feels like to do that for a day, right? Now, here's what I want you to also realize. The doubts that I'm having about those are my OCD, right? And if you're looking for a way to separate these things out, are you able to take a look at objectively, right? Here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm thinking about doing or feeling about what I'm doing or, or, or have an image of what I'm doing, even though here's what I'm doing, but I have this image of it, right? And, and that can be where, where it can get really confusing, right? What should I trust? Should I trust what I'm actually doing and seeing? Or should I trust this image that pops into my head that tells me that I'm doing something different, e even though I have no evidence of that actually happening? So am I actually just standing here at the curb next to somebody or am I really pushing them into the street as, as I'm seeing in my head, right? Or because I have this image of myself doing that, right? And which one is the truth? Right? Well, as much as possible, what would it be like to spend a day living according to what it is that, that you're not imaging, but that you're actually experiencing? just to try it for a day, right? And, and, and all I want you to do out of that is to be able to recognize that OCD can warp and twist things in your head, leading you to doubt anything that could be important to you. So if to you, Thomas, living in a world that's real is very important, then guess what OCD is going to say? What if it's not? Right. 
if if experiencing real things are so important to you, Thomas, OCD is going to say to you, how do you know they're real? Now, here's an interesting piece, Thomas. People without OCD don't really care. They just go and live their life, right? They They just don't care about that. And you could say to somebody without OCD, hey, how do you know this is real? They're like, uh, seems to be. And then they would go on and they'd probably just walk past you and just brush on and go on with their day. One of the ways to maybe recognize OCD is OCD loves to ask questions and get people stuck on things that almost nobody else in the world gets stuck on. Right? Look at all those people who went to the gas station and used the gas pump and didn't wash their hands. I could never do that. I have to think about all the germs and all the people who touched it and everything they can get on. And then what if I eat something and then it gets in my mouth and then I get the germs. And I might as well have licked the gas, uh, you know, <laughs> handle or something like that. Because OCD leads you to think things in such ways that people without OCD just don't go down the road or don't even care about. Something to think about. <laughs> Stephanie says, my OCD has recently taken the form of an urge to count things like floor tiles, stripes on a design, even the freckles on my body. I have no trouble ignoring the urge out of my environment. Okay. But when I'm home, oh, out in your environment, probably. But when you're home, you have this thought, if I don't count this particular thing, I'll never stop thinking about it. Then sure enough, I'll count one thing and another comes up any advice? Well, let's test it out. How do you know that you'll never stop thinking about something if you don't count it and, and test it? See, this is what's interesting about OCD. OCD says things like this. Stephanie, if you don't count this thing, you'll never stop thinking about it. And you go, well, that seems true and real. I better go do that counting then, or because I don't want to think about that for the rest of my life, right? I've got to do that. But but here's here's what I want to challenge, Stephanie. How do you know that OCD's told you the truth in that? How do you know that's actually real? What proof do you have that that is actually true? Just think about it. Could you actually prove to me that if you didn't count something, that would be the only thing that you would think about for the rest of your life? So I've got, um, let's see, I've got three, four, maybe even more. I've got a couple of, you know, so I'm not going to count all of them. I can see three, but I, there's a couple others here. There, there. So um, I'm going to sit here now and not count all the pens and pencils that are on my desk because there's several of them, actually. <laughs> maybe I need to clean my desk, but um, I'm not going to count them. So Stephanie, according to you, I won't be able to do this webinar anymore because I've now thought about the pencils and I'm not going to count all of them. So therefore, I apologize to everyone else. I won't be able to answer any more questions tonight due to the fact that I am now stuck on only thinking about the pencils on my desk for the rest of my life because I've chosen not to count them, is what we would be saying, right? Which, which when I say it out loud, again, doesn't make a lot of sense logically, but in OCD logic, boy, of course, that makes a hundred percent sense. Why? Why wouldn't it be that way? That that seems absolutely right and true, and the only way that it would actually be. So, something to to consider there. Christina says, "Good evening, Doctor McGrath. Hello, Kimberly Quinlan. I know her. Just did a six part podcast on mental compulsions and ruminations. What are your tricks, tips for getting out of the rumination loop?" Uh, you know, here, here's what I just try to tell people right off the bat. And, and Kim is wonderful. So just, she's great. I ask people one question. Will you ever actually come up with an answer to this thing that you are attempting to ruminate on and try to figure out? And have you yet come up with an answer? Because here's here's one thing I know, and and there's very few things that I would 
I would uh, put the word guarantee toward. In fact, I, I don't even like saying it right now, but but I, I'll say this. From my clinical experience and the clinical experience of anyone I've ever met, here's what I do know so far. And that is, no one has ever thought about something enough to have finally gotten an answer that would have satisfied OCD to the point where OCD would say, oh, okay, well, good. We've got an answer. Thank you so much. I'm I'm going to go now. Um, everything's been solved and settled and um, I'll just, I'm going to go pack up my belongings and I'm going to go visit the next person and and uh, have them uh, figure something else out, right? That That has never happened. And so what are my tricks or tips for getting out of rumination? They are to ask people, what is your goal in the rumination here? Well, I'm hoping to figure this out. First, people will say, "Well, I can't stop it." Right. Okay, All right. Well, um, if you can't stop it, then I'm useful because I'm uh, I'm not useful because I'm I'm very useless to people for for things that they can't uh, do. Right. So if you can't stop something, I'm I'm a, a useless waste of time to you. So it's not about that I can't stop it. Right. So let's get past that one. What is it about then? In the end, it's very often the attempt to try to come up with an answer. And is there ever a good enough answer to give to OCD? No. Doesn't exist. Doesn't work that way. So we're not here to give OCD an answer. Even though OCD demands one. And even though we believe that we should give it one. The reality of the whole thing is that we can't. There's a can't I'll go with, right? We can't, so far, as far as I can tell, we can't give OCD an answer that it will say is 100% accepted. And the reason why is because OCD's nickname is the doubting disorder, and the doubting disorder doubts everything, even the answers that you give it. Now, the only thing that I've ever found that OCD agrees with is if somebody says to it, well, maybe, then OCD would be like, aha, see, someone who's finally telling the truth, right? 99 out of 100 doctors say, there's nothing on the scans. We've checked, there's nothing there. One doctor says, well, there might be this tiny little thing. And OCD is going to go, I knew those 99 were wrong because this person speaks the truth finally. Finally, I have found someone who is giving me the answers. Tell me more, doctor, about this little spot on there that might be something because I think you're the only one who's on to something. I think you're the only one who has figured it out. Yes, let's go down this road. Nothing good comes out of that, right? Because what you will say for a very long time after that is, well, but this one doctor said maybe. So therefore, there could be something. And as long as there could be something, there probably is, because in OCD, possibility equals probability, which means if it's possible, it's 100% guaranteed probable, and therefore, it's a yes. It's a definite yes in this case. Right? Hmm. Alex says, how is it possible to develop OCD when I have shown minimal signs in the past? It's a hard pill to swallow, especially when it's hard OCD. It's hard for me at times to accept my diagnosis that I have OCD when I didn't for 27 years of my life. I've been working with no OCD for the past few months. That's wonderful. Uh, oh, hold on. It skipped on me. Let me go back up here. Uh, and I've seen improvement. Great. But the thoughts and feelings are still very strong. So Alec, we talk about this from something that we call the diathesis stress model. And those, of course, are, um, you know, big scientific -y words. So let's talk about what those really mean. And they basically mean this. All of us have certain predispositions to developing certain things, but need the right stressors to kick that thing off. Right. Let me take it out of OCD for a minute. I was talking to a buddy of mine recently who said, he hurt his back. 50 years old. Never hurt his back in his life. Never had a day of back pain in his life. 
and just, you know, bent over to pick up a piece of laundry and bam, something snapped. And he said for two weeks, he could barely walk. Now, Alec, how does that happen? How can you go 50 years without ever having a, even a, a twinge of back pain and then one day just bend over and do something you've done thousands of times and then suddenly, bam, something happened. The mind and the body have a bit of mystery to them, right? Who knows why that day at that time that happened? Alec, I wish I could tell you why suddenly harm OCD at this age popped into your life. All I can tell you is this. There was some kind of potential genetic predisposition toward it. Don't know if it was a huge one or not. May have been a tiny one. May have been a big one. But you also had some kind of what appears to probably to be environmental stressor. Might not even have been something that you would even notice that much. But the stars aligned that day at the right time and the right hour to have something lead you to have a bit of an earworm that went, wait a minute, what if? And that caught you different that day than it ever did before. And that was what OCD needed to germinate into the soil in your brain and to grow the kudzu vines that it loves to grow all over the place. If you don't know what kudzu is, look it up. So here's the thing, Alec. I'm far less concerned about why, and I'm more concerned about what are you going to do about it. We could conjecture for hours about why here, but I don't know that it actually leads us to solve anything. And Alec, I'd much rather spend time trying to figure out what are you going to do about it instead of why you have it. And I hope that you will continue to put forth that effort as well, too, with your No City therapist, who, by the way, uh, hey, Wednesday night webinar brought to you by No City, No City, a downloadable app. You get through Google Play or iOS. Check us out, everybody. And if you're looking for teletherapy, we're available in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. And we're doing uh, all sorts of teletherapy for that. We're also working with body-focused repetitive behaviors like uh, ticks, and and we're working with excoriation and trichotillomania and hoarding. And uh, we're also doing these fun education sessions as well, too. So we're calling them our No CD 411 sessions. If you're a friend or family member, somebody with OCD, and maybe they're not quite ready for primetime therapy, but you want to talk to somebody about uh, what OCD is and what therapy would look like, reach out to us and set up one of those sessions as well. Too. Rowan says, I think if this person dies in a month, I'm going to hell. Um, then a few days later, someone else dies, not the person I'm talking about, but uh, someone else. Is this magical thinking or real? Well, uh, Rowan, someone dies every day. So here's here's the thing. Um, I could think about every anyone dying, but uh, there will still be people that will die today. How much did I influence those people dying would be my question. Uh, same thing for birth. We could go to, if I think about somebody being born, uh, you know, whatever it might be, you know, we, we could think about the car accidents. There's, there's car accidents every day. There's, uh, there's people every day who go to take the pit out of an avocado with a knife and the, the knife slides off the pit and slices into their hand. That, that happens at probably at least once a day too. I'm going to bet at least one emergency room somewhere in the world on a daily basis is dealing, is dealing with one of those things happening. Uh, so um, here's what we know about magical thinking, Rowan. Your OCD will make links to things in any way possible, right? And say, ah, but what if you had some kind of say in that? What if, what if your thoughts somehow influenced the world of that? This is thought butterfly effect, right? Thinking something is as bad as doing something, and therefore your thought caused something to happen. This is thought action fusion at its best slash worst in these types of situations. So um, you know, I can think about lots of people dying. Uh, I don't know what that's going to mean for my afterlife. I can tell myself it means something, but but just because I do doesn't mean that I have proof of of anything as well, too. So yeah, I can I can tell myself anything.
uh chad's reaching out uh a former patient he says hey hey chad um and says now that you're a father thing it's it's a struggle um people make co-workers make comments about your checking either jokingly or frustrated that you take longer to do things any advice you're so afraid of your ocd becoming unmanageable again even though you try the erp i taught you that's good well uh chad reach out uh nothing nothing like a couple of booster sessions to be able to have just uh just to make sure that things are going the way that they need to be going and i would say that to anybody as well too you know there's there's no harm or shame anyone in reaching back out to a therapist if you notice that some symptoms are trying to creep back in or something like that hey number one uh we therapists don't don't look at those things and go oh god they failed <laughs> or oh geez it's back. That means I suck as a therapist because uh, things have have kind of come back again. I mean, Chad, if you've gone since 2014 and and uh, done pretty well, and now you're seeing a little bit of uptick in something, then I'd say, wow, awesome! What a, what a great ride you had there. And now, nothing wrong with a a little bit of a booster uh, shot to, to to do that. I mean, hell, look at that. Look, we talk about this all the time in society, right? Boosters are things that we do. What why not have a mental health booster as well, too? Not just a physical health one, but why not a, a mental health booster as well? So, Chad, reach out to us at NoCD. Let's see if we can get you that booster and, and uh, we'll help you out. Kim says, sometimes I feel okay, but extremely hyper. Is this an OCD symptom? Um, not necessarily, right? Uh, I mean, it, it, it could, I, uh, I don't know. Uh, there's not a lot to go on on that one, so it's hard to say. But it's not necessarily an OCD symptom. Kim, if you're questioning that, again, I would reach out and talk to a therapist who can help with to see what's actually going on with you. Kyle says, I've been struggling with wondering if I want to act on my intrusive thoughts. I don't think I do, but OCD always has a what if for me that makes me question myself. Well, Kyle, thank you for uh, amazingly describing exactly what happens in harm uh, types of intrusive thoughts. So, uh, or it doesn't even have to be harm, right? No, I'm not saying that that these are, you didn't say harm there. I'm just, I jumped to that one because those are the types that people often talk about are afraid that they would act on. Um, so this is a classic OCD. So right now I'm struggling with wondering, okay? Sounds very OCD. If I want to act on, sounds like very OCD. I don't think I do. Sounds like very OCD. But OCD has a what if for me, very OCD, that makes me question myself. Incredibly OCD. I mean, there's there's the five OCD qualifiers listed right there, Kyle, in whatever you wrote right there, right? They're, they're, they're all sorts of those things. And that's, that's the kind of stuff, you know, uh, OCD loves, a, what if I'm fixing to get ready to do something that I don't know that I'm fixing to get ready to do kind of thing, right? And then OCD loves that kind of thing. It's just going to jump all over something like that and, and tell people, well, maybe, and, and how, how do you know? Maybe, maybe you don't know that you, you wanted to do this thing. And what if you didn't know that you maybe did want to do this thing and wouldn't that be bad or something, you know, just on and on and on with the qualifiers and everything like that. It just gets to be so overwhelming for people to get so stuck in these types of things. Right. And that's what I want you to pay attention to Kyle is that, you know, is it worth giving OCD all this time and credit? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think OCD is worth the time. Honestly, I just, I just really don't, just don't see it really at all being worth the time that you're giving it. And I want you to keep that in mind that uh, OCD is a big time suck telling you that you need to be worried about all these qualifiers all the time, because can you ever have enough qualifiers for OCD to feel safe? No, you can't. You need more and more of them. You need the what ifs and the yeah buts and the and the I'm wondering and fixing to get readies and what if I were to want to and I don't think I do but uh, maybe and questioning and all those kinds of things, all that all that stuff. Remember, OCD is the doubting disorder. All those things are doubts. I mean, I doubt I want to do it, but what if I do want to do it? I don't think I want to do it, but what if I did? Can you promise me that I won't do it? And how can I trust your promise? Right. 
so much time spent on trying to figure out OCD when OCD is not figure outable in any way. Okay. Delius says, Dr. McGrath, I just had a quick question about old thoughts coming up or some event leading to that. Is this normal or am I still giving importance to these thoughts? Thanks. I mean, things come up, right? Things come up. Think about our, our brothers and sisters in the substance abuse world. It's not that they don't have urges or cravings for substances now and then. They do, right? Totally normal, right? They don't have to give in to those, but it's totally normal to have those. So know this, that it's totally normal to have those kinds of things in OCD as well, too. You, you may get a, a bit of an earworm once in a while, right? You, you may notice a, an urge for something now and then to, to go back to an old habit, an old compulsion, or wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be easy to go do the kind of thing? Normal, 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 normal. Let's, let's not over pathologize anything like that. Totally normal kinds of stuff. Okay. Keep that in mind. Michelle says, when sitting with anxiety and panic attacks, why do I feel like I'm about to lose control and act on the rights? Um, I don't know what you mean by act on the rights, but uh, you suffer from harm OCD theme. Thank you. So panic can, uh, oh, act on the thoughts. <laughs> you corrected in the next one. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. Um, well, first of all, why wouldn't you think that you would act on the thoughts and harm OCD? I mean, if if you never thought that you would act on them, I wouldn't have a job. I, there would be nothing you would need from me whatsoever because you'd be like, oh, there's that harm. I would never act on that. So no big deal. Whatever. So, so of course, you're going to be afraid of what if. And then panic, right? Let's talk about panic, right? So when a panic attack comes, what happens? We feel very out of control. Well, geez, talk about a phrase that OCD hates out of control? Wait a minute. This is a no-no. We must be in total control. We must be in total control of the way we think. We must be in total control of the way we feel. We must be in total control of the way we act, right? The way we behave, something like that. So if I'm not in total control of the way I think, and I'm not in total control of the way I feel, and I'm not in total control of the way I behave, well, crap, I'm going to go do something then. I must, therefore, be in 100% absolute control of everything at all times to prevent myself from becoming an axe murderer or from getting contaminated by things or from running over someone with my car or from leaving my relationship that I find myself in or, you know, what, whatever it is, insert your OCD type in there, right? I've, I've got to be in total control. Well, guess what? Nobody in the world is in total control. Every single person in the world has weird, random crap popping into their head throughout the day. It, it just happens. And the smallest things can trigger them, right? There's a uh, there's a restaurant that I go to that uses a cleaning product in the front hallway that every time that I go in there, it smells like the cleaning products they used at the resort that we used to go to when I was a kid with my family, and I'm instantaneously transported back to the uh, to that resort whenever I whenever I walk into that place, just from that smell. If, if a smell can bring me back to something, right, and I'm back in that moment again as a kid, do I have to figure out how to control my reactions to the smell so that I don't have memories of that anymore? Because what if, what if I didn't want memories of that thing, right? Should I, should I then avoid anything that smells like that to make sure that I never have memories of it so that I never have to deal with the discomfort that I might have about memories of that thing that the smell reminds me of? Or can I just learn that, okay, I can have a smell. I can smell the smell. 
And yeah, maybe it reminds me of something and I can move on from it, right? Uh, Michelle, you're you're basically saying here that panic almost weakens my constitution. And so I, I'm very over-controlled. But if I have a panic attack, I start losing the ability to be over-controlled. And if I'm not over-controlled anymore, then what if I then go ahead and now that my my defenses are down or my guards down, what if I then give in to all the stuff that I've tried to be so over-controlled about to make sure that I never do? Well, what I want you to realize, Michelle, is that panic or not, I don't have to waste all my time trying to be in control of everything because I'm actually not in control of everything. And in the world of not being in control of everything, I've not actually gone and done all the things that are in my thoughts. Hope that makes sense. Elmo says, Elmo, how do you recommend dealing with the fact that focusing too much on fixing your OCD might become a compulsion and yet not trying to fix it will keep you in your compulsions? Great question, Elmo. Thank you. Um, here's what I want you to do, Elmo. I want you to realize this. The first part of your question really comes up when OCD takes over OCD treatment. So OCD will say, oh, you appear to want to get rid of me. Well, the only way to get rid of me is to do it the absolutely right way. That's the only way that I will go. So if you want to get rid of me, let's apply what I like to do, which is to be perfect and everything to getting rid of me, which means, of course, you're going to fail in getting rid of me because there's no way that you will perfectly be able to get rid of me or to apply what you need to do to get rid of me perfectly. And therefore, you're stuck with me. And that's the way it is. So do I want you to be focused on fixing your OCD? Maybe fixing the wrong word there. Do I want you to be focused on doing ERP? Yeah. Do I want you to be refocused on response prevention? Sure. Fixing could lead to the idea of getting rid of. I wish I knew how to help people get rid of OCD. That I don't know how to do. But I do know how to help people do response prevention. How to get people to not give in to the OCD. And I think that when you focus on that, you get better. And you feel better. That's the thing to focus on. Kyle says, another thing is that I feel numb to my intrusive thoughts and numb in general. My OCD uses this against me to prove I want, like my intrusive thoughts, I will eventually act on them, that I'm a sociopath. Yeah, I love this one too. So um, I'm very numb to the fact of, well, <laughs> here. I'm done to the fact that it's potential that I could take a bottle of alcohol that I have here in my house. I could stuff a rag in it, light it on fire, run across the street, throw it at my neighbor Dave's house, blowing it up with the Molotov cocktail that I have. Then I'm also numb to the fact that I can go into the middle of the street with a paper bag and poop into it and light it on fire and throw it in front of my neighbor Josh's house, ring the doorbell, then he can come out and stomp on it. And then I'm numb to the fact that on the way back home, running away from Josh while I'm laughing at him, I could shoot a few geese that are up in the air flying over my house because there's a bond behind my house. And then I'm numb to the fact that I could do all of that and not care about it and then come back to this webinar. I am absolutely numb to that. I have zero feelings about it whatsoever. So Kyle, am I a sociopath? If, if your proof of a sociopath is being numb to the idea of something, then I am, according to your rule. And then some people will say, well, but think about people who do carry out things. They're numb to it, and then they go and carry it out. Great. Okay. I got you. So they follow up their numbness to something with action. Now, you're telling me, what if I eventually do take an act because I'm numb to something? So that let me go back to my example. Does then my being 
numb to the idea that I'd blow up my neighbor Dave's house and I'd put a poopy bag of a flaming poopy bag in front of Josh's house. Does does my numbness to that increase the likelihood of it happening? Does my numbness of that to that prove that I want or like it? No, I will say I think it's funny. I mean, I, I actually find humor in that example. <laughs> Flaming poopy bags are hysterical. But um, does the fact that I am numb to it prove that I want or like it and therefore that I will eventually act on it? That we have to decide, right? Um, I'm going to live with my thought about it, which is no, I'm, I'm going to go with that. Can I give you a 100% guarantee that it will never happen? I cannot. I, I absolutely cannot give you a 100% guarantee that I will not follow through on that. Right? There's just no way to do it. Do I think I'll ever do it? No, I absolutely do not. Can I promise? I, I mean, I could say I promise I'll never do it. But can I absolutely, with 100%, no doubt at all certainty, say to you, I will never do that? I could say it. But I just can't give you the guarantee that it won't ever happen. And I think one of the differences you'll find is that for people with or without OCD, people without OCD will be like, that's good enough for me. <sighs> We're good. That's fine. I'm totally cool. And people with OCD say, that's not acceptable. I need more than that. I absolutely 100% need more than that. I need an absolute guarantee. And this is why I think people with OCD remain stuck in their, in their OCD because they keep on searching out the absolute guarantees and can never actually find the absolute guarantees because the absolute guarantees don't exist, but their OCD keeps telling them, oh, but it does. And that's a lie of OCD. The lie of OCD is, oh, but it does exist. And you need to go out there and you need to find it, buddy. Because if you don't, then eventually you're probably going to act on it because, I mean, look at you. How dare you not be bothered by that? How dare you be so cavalier as to feel numb about something? Bush Ranger says, can OCD turn into psychosis with hallucinations and voices? Well, I've not seen that, but what I have definitely seen is people with OCD afraid that that's going to happen, and that become the subject of a lot of their obsessions, that's for sure. Uh, Nushin says, I just read a couple of articles on how having OCD significantly increases the risk of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, question mark. I've not read anything like that, nor have I heard anything like that. Um, I'll I'll check it out to see, but uh, I'd be interested if that came from a peer-reviewed journal or just uh, some somebody out there uh, writing things like, uh, you know, the other way to make OCD go away is to drink celery juice or something like that. So uh, I have I have no comment on that one because I've not seen it. I try to keep up on the research pretty good on something like that, so I've not seen anything of that nature. Corey says, when expecting uncertainty... It's not just a trick. We are trying to play on ourselves, right? We are supposed to actually accept that something might be that we don't want. Uh, I would like you to be able, Corey, to recognize that possibility doesn't equal probability. That though there is a possibility out there, however remote in the world it might actually be, it doesn't mean that it's highly probable. And that's what I would like you to, to really walk away with, Corey, is that 
OCD doesn't like that. OCD says, no, 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 no. I want no possibility. And Corey, I want you to go with, I accept amazingly low probability. There, there's a difference there, right? I mean, but I, but I hope that that really comes across and makes sense to you. That I want you to accept, Corey, I can live in a world where there's amazingly low probabilities of things happening and I can function in that world. But I can't help you, Corey, figure out a way to live in a world where nothing is possible if you don't want it to be possible. I mean, people with harm OCD will say to me, I want a zero possibility that I'll ever run someone over. Can you help him with that? No. Because because I can't guarantee that I myself won't run somebody over. So if I can give myself a guarantee that I won't run someone over, there's no way that I can give you a guarantee that you won't run someone over. But I think it's a really low probability, so I'm going to keep driving. And I'm willing to live with that level of risk. And I hope you would be able to do the same thing, Corey. I hope you would do that too. Carissa says, what about worrying about having these thoughts every day forever? It ends up driving you crazy or making you end up depressed forever. Well, Carissa, that's why we go ahead and we do treatment, right? Um, that's that's why we we help people every day, especially here at NoCD, you know, the stuff that we find to be so important to use the NoCD platform and, and why Stephen Smith, our CEO, wanted to find uh, a better way to help people who had OCD so they wouldn't have to suffer the way that he did for so long with OCD. And uh, you don't have to be worrying about these thoughts forever. And you don't have to worry about the images forever. And you don't have to worry about the urges forever. And you don't need to be concerned about these things driving you crazy or making you end up depressed forever because there's really great treatment that's available to help you. And so you could spend all sorts of time what ifing all of this, or you could say, hey, there's great therapy. I mean, Carissa, would you spend the rest of your life worrying about knee pain? Or would you go find a specialist to work on your knee? You could spend the rest of your life worrying about what if my knee starts to hurt and then what if the cartilage goes away and then what if I'm bone on bone and then what if I can't walk anymore and what if I'll be uh, wheelchair bound for the rest of my life? Or you could say, I think I'll go get my knees checked out to make sure everything's okay. You can do that for your brain too. That's why we're here. Uh, Suki says, I had off over 25 years. Okay, I stay in home a lot, going to visit your daughters tomorrow. OCD says, don't hug them, but uh, you will do it. How do you fight OCD, uh, like doing long showers and things of that nature? So here's what we know, Suki. We know this, that OCD eats compulsions for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. <laughs> so if you want OCD to get stronger, do compulsions. If you want OCD to get weaker, don't do compulsions. That's, that's about as simple as I can say it to you and hope for it to make sense. But basically, that is what it is. If you give in to doing what OCD wants you to do, you will make OCD stronger. And if you go the opposite of what OCD wants you to do, it will lead OCD to become weaker. And my hope, Suki, is that you will decide that you are going to do anything that you possibly can to make OCD weaker and not strong. Okay. Michelle uh, says, uh, oh, oh, you were talking to Bush Mansion there. Sophia says, I've been getting stuck on every thought I have. It doesn't matter what it is. POCD is what I struggle with the most, but lately have thoughts about anything. 
So, Sophia, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll continue to uh, work with a therapist. And if, and if you aren't already working with a therapist, I would hope that you would reach out to one because, um, again, using great exposure and response prevention therapy can be very helpful in a situation like you're finding yourself in there where you're getting stuck on everything that's popping into your head and likely doing compulsions. And as I just said to Suki above, uh, the more compulsions you do, the more likely you're going to do compulsions and the worse your OCD is going to get. So um, often when people tell me they're getting stuck on a thought, what that really means is they're doing compulsions around the thought. And so, Sophia, what I would want you to do is to work with me on not giving into those compulsions, but allowing for whatever thought to be there, not neutralizing it, just letting it be, right? Just like I continue to let be the thought that I might run across the street with a Molotov cocktail and throw it at my neighbor Dave's house, setting it on fire, then run into the middle of the street, poop into a bag, set it on fire, go over to my neighbor Josh's house, ring the doorbell, watch him come out, stomp on the poopy bag of poop and get poopy flamies on his shoe. And that would be funny. And then I'll shoot a few geese on the way home and then I'll come back here into this webinar. Still not bothered by that whatsoever. I have zero remorse for that thought. And also don't believe that now that I've said it out loud, it means that it's more likely to make me do it either. But if I had OCD, I'd be like, whoa, now I got to do everything I can to protect that. So I got to get rid of any paper bags that I have. So that way I can't poop in one and set it on fire. And I should get rid of all the alcohol bottles that I have and anything uh, that could cause a flame so that I can't actually throw a Molotov cocktail. And, um, I should probably call my neighbors as well too and warn them maybe to put up a fence around their house so that I can't get close so that I can't put a flamey poopy bag of, uh, onto their, onto their porch. Or if I was going to launch a Molotov cocktail, it'd have to be from far away and, and, uh, not very close. And maybe I would be a bad shot and I would miss. Or I could just have the thought, right. And just, just be like, yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm just going to go with that. Yanni says, can you have random and non-recurring obsessions, compulsions, or do they have to be the same thoughts, compulsions for it to be considered OCD? Uh, I think we saw earlier, we have people who talk about uh, those things can randomly shift. Uh, so they don't, they don't have to be all the, uh, the same thing all the time. Kyle says, do you get more intrusive thoughts from hearing so many people's intrusive thoughts constantly? Do other OCD therapists experience more intrusive thoughts too? Uh, I get, Kyle, I have so many intrusive thoughts. It's ridiculous, actually. Uh, I, Kyle, I'm at a point that I can't really do much in my life without having intrusive thoughts pop into my head. Uh, but guess what, Kyle? I'm bothered zero by by any of them whatsoever. Um, in fact, I'm always kind of fascinated which thoughts pop into my head. So Kyle, as I've said to people, and I'll say it again here, if any of you are going to be going to Denver to the International OCD Foundation Conference, if if I see any of you there and we happen to be, say, on a stairwell or an escalator, you come up to me and say, hi, I will I will uh, have a lovely chat with you. And uh, if it's cool with you, shake your hand or, or whatever and take a picture with you if you want or uh, I don't care, whatever you want. But I will probably also think about pushing you down the stairs as well. Too. And uh, I will do that only because I haven't been able to take a stairway or or a escalator for the last 20 years without con considering pushing people down them. It's just a thing that pops into my head. Uh, as of yet, have not done it, nor do I worry about it. I am totally uh, like whatever to the thoughts. And uh, and notice in 20 years of being whatever to a thought like that, still haven't gone and pushed people down the stair. So hopefully that proves a point to everybody that... Uh, you know, all those intrusive thoughts that you think are so bad or awful or horrible, your therapists are hearing and not being bothered by them in the slightest whatsoever personally. Now, you might say, well, that's fine because the thought doesn't count for them. It counts for me. And, and I call that specialness. The rules of the world apply to me differently than everybody else. It's OK if other people have this thought. But if I have it, oh, no, no, no. It's fine if other people have this image or urge, but if I have it, oh, no, 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 not allowed. Bad, 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 bad. And I would ask why. What makes you special? Why are the rules of the world applying to you differently than they are to the other eight and a half billion people who live on the planet, right? Think about that. I'm going to give all of you a homework tonight. 
Your homework for the rest of tonight is to treat yourself as if you actually liked yourself. Your homework for the rest of the night is to do this. Anytime anything goes well, I want you to say to yourself, I rock, that was totally awesome, nice job, great work. Anytime anything goes wrong, I want you to say to yourself, ah, who cares, nobody noticed, no big deal, whatever. See how you feel at the end of tonight. That is the way you treat people you love and respect. I want you to treat yourself in the same way that you treat those that you love and respect. You don't have to believe it. I just want you to do it. I get that you might not believe it. Tomorrow, I want you to do the opposite. Tomorrow, I'd like you to treat everybody you know like you normally treat yourself. Tomorrow, anytime anybody does anything wrong, go up to them and say, that was stupid. I can't believe you did that. You're a moron. You should probably die. And anytime they do anything well, go up to them and say, well, it was luck. It's not like you actually deserved that or anything. And of course, now that something good happened, something bad's bound to happen. So you better be careful because karma, well, it is not a friend to you whatsoever. Right? Now, Don't actually do that tomorrow, but hopefully you get the point. We are wonderful at motivating other people. We are horribly awful at motivating ourselves. We try to get ourselves to be better by reminding my, ourselves of every dumb, stupid thing we've ever done. We wouldn't do that to anybody else, though. So maybe one of the first things all of you could do this week to try to feel better is to treat yourself as if you actually liked yourself. Show yourself that you deserve to be treated well. Because guess what? OCD doesn't give a crap about you or your friends, or your family, or your job, or your school, or any obligations you have. OCD's a two-year-old in a candy store throwing a tantrum going, wait, wait, do I want more? No, 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 don't, no. Over here, over here, over here. Pay attention here, here. I want more. You need to give to me first, right? OCD would be, if you're going down on a plane, OCD would say, don't put your mask on first, put mine on first. Heck with you, I put my mask on first. Right? <laughs> that, that's what OCD would, that's how much of a jackass OCD is. Oh, no, no, don't put your mask on. Give me mine first. Do you want to be friends with OCD? And do you want to keep feeding it? Or do you want it to go away? Think about that, everyone. Thanks again for spending an hour with me here tonight. It's been a joy. No CD, a downloadable app. You get through Google Play or iOS, teletherapy throughout the world. And we do work on hoarding and BFRBs and ticks and, and all sorts of great stuff. And... We also do education sessions too. So if you are a family member, a friend of somebody with OCD looking for some info on OCD, reach out to us. We would love to assist you. It's been a joy to be with all of you once again. Please, please be kind to yourselves because OCD ain't going to be. Talk to you later. Tonight, I want to sleep tonight.